So let's break down the term. Chronic, meaning persistent or recurring for a long time. Traumatic, denoting physical injury, and encephalopathy, meaning damage or disease that affects the brain. So basically, CTE is a series of traumatic events that happen at the level of the brain over an extended period of time. But what's actually happening physiologically? Now, at this point, there probably aren't many of you who haven't heard the term CTE being thrown around in conversation. And despite some of the devastating things that we already know about brain injuries, and specifically CTE, you still hear this common phrase. And what consequences are, but I know what I'm getting myself into. Or, I do and I just know what I signed up for. I just don't want to Obviously, I don't want to be like someone with a glass jaw when I'm like 40. But are combat athletes really informed on what could happen to them? Sometimes I'm not too sure. Now this hits close to home because I've personally seen the effects of CTE in younger athletes, particularly ones that I treated early in my career as an athletic trainer, and in some of my old college football teammates that are beginning to receive some pretty heartbreaking news that seem related to their negligence while we were playing really only about a decade ago. So, in order to make sure that one of the communities that I care about most is truly informed about CTE, I decided to do a three-part educational series on it. The first video is dedicated to the anatomy and mechanisms of CTE, so that by the end you'll be much more confident on what you know about it. What's most interesting about this disease is that the big concussive blows that we see in knockouts likely aren't contributing as much as the repetitive subconcussive blows to the head, like the ones that we receive when we're sparring during training, or the multiple hits in the fight that land but aren't enough to end the fight. In a previous video of mine I explained the physiology of a knockout, and in that video we go through the anatomy of a neuron, which is important to understand when you're learning about CTE. Pay attention closely here. The neuron has three basic parts. The cell body, the axon, and the dendrite. The cell body controls the cell's activities and holds the genetic material. The second part, the axon, is the part I really want you to remember because it's super important when it comes to the understanding the mechanism of the physiology of a knockout. And the axon is responsible for sending messages from the cell. And the dendrite is responsible for receiving messages from other neurons. Now that we're caught up on the anatomy of a neuron, let's talk about axons specifically. When axons are damaged, it not only affects their ability to carry signals, but also the distribution of chemicals and different materials throughout the cell. And these channels of distribution distribution located in the axons are called microtubules, and these microtubules need help supporting their structure since they're even smaller than axons. This is made possible by tau proteins. Tau proteins are even referred to as microtubule stabilizing proteins, obviously named for its role. So we have neurons. Within the neurons we have axons, which are supported by microtubules which are stabilized by tau proteins. So now let's talk about mechanisms. I mentioned earlier that CTE is brought on by multiple subconcussive blows to the head. Subconcussive meaning blows that are not forceful enough to elicit symptoms. Let's play this out. Over the course of years, you take hundreds, potentially thousands of subconcussive blows to the head during training. This begins to slowly damage the axon, particularly the microtubule. And when the microtubule takes on enough damage, the tau proteins can actually become destabilizing. It can begin to do things like fold improperly, detach, float freely around the cell. And once this starts to happen, it's thought that it causes other tau proteins to malfunction within the same cell, ultimately leading to its death. And this process is often occurring in many different neurons at the exact same time. Not to mention that the process is a pretty slow one, which is why we don't see the effects of CTE until later on in life. Once this process starts, it seems to occur especially in the sulci or the crevices of the brain and can travel throughout the entire brain progressing through different stages. Here's an illustration from Dr. Elizabeth Sandel's book, The Science, Care, and Treatment of of concussion that highlights the areas of the brain affected in stage 3 CTE. And since each area of the brain is responsible for different movements, emotions, decision making processes, the symptoms that we see manifest in someone tells us a lot about the area of the brain that's affected. We can see changes in speech, increased irritability, decreased inhibition similar to when someone is drunk, and even differences in movement quality. And the numbers on CTE are staggering. But we're going to keep that for part 2 of this series, which is dedicated to the statistics that we currently have on CTE in the combat sport. Listen, these decisions are really tough to make. On one hand, you want to make sure that everybody is informed and safe. And you want everybody to maintain the right to do what they want to with their bodies and how they want to do it. But on the other hand, we need to be certain that we're educating combat athletes properly and frequently, especially on how to train as safely as possible once the decision is made that they're going to compete or fight. So now you're reasonably informed on how CTE arises and progressively attacks the brain. And as I mentioned a little earlier, part two of the series is going to be dedicated to the sobering statistics that we have right now on CTE in the combat sports. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time.